Coming up today, get ready to dive into the roller coaster ride of a third year trainee clinical psychologist's journey. We're about to spill the beans on personal and professional growth, and trust me, it's anything but boring. Whether you're into self discovery, figuring out your own career chaos, or just love a good story of transformation, then this episode is for you. We are peeling back the layers of the ups and downs of a psychology career and exploring how we all go through some pretty significant changes and growth as a result. Hit play, grab a cuppa and let's get real about the messy, beautiful evolution we call life as a psychologist. Hope you find it so useful. Hi, welcome along to the Aspiring Psychologist podcast. I am Dr. Marianne Trent and I'm a qualified clinical psychologist. So I am joined today by Phil and yeah, I think you're going to find it a really interesting episode. I found it such a privilege to speak with him. So I will catch you on the other side. Just want to welcome Phil Pampalove to the podcast today. Welcome along, Phil. Hi, Marianne, and thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for saying yes. I reached out to you via LinkedIn because I saw your research. So you are a trainee clinical psychologist and we will come on to what that's been like for you. But you are currently doing your research kind of recruitment drive, I think. Is that fair to say you're still in that cycle currently? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Lovely. So could you tell us before we kind of get into all of that, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into psychology? Yeah, gosh, where do I begin? Uh, <laughs> so basically, I when I was at school, I didn't really know, you know, like many, many children, exactly what I wanted to do at the very start. I know some people are like, I want to be a nurse when I grow up. I wasn't quite like that. And also bearing in mind that I, I grew up in, in Bulgaria, that's where I went to school. So I think that's kind of that cultural difference is important as well. So I remember going for a period in secondary school where I was thinking, I want to be a film director, I want to be a teacher, I want to be this and that. And I didn't fully kind of know really what I wanted to do. Yeah, it was definitely my teenage years where I kind of started thinking about it a bit more fully and thinking, who, you know, who am I? What's important to me? Where do I see myself? I knew that I wanted to work with people and also knew I wanted to help people to kind of help understand themselves. And obviously, again, that's not, you know, that's still such a broad thing to think about. But I remember saying to myself, you know, psychology is such a big field, you know, and this is where you do work a lot with people not in like a very kind of corporate but in the more sorts of you know empathetic way so I thought to myself you know let me do a psychology degree and see what you know where exactly that's going to take me because psychology in itself is so so vast as a discipline so I did my undergraduate degree between 2011 2014 in the UK during the first year, again, I kind of found myself in that place where I was like, I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> like, again, I knew I wanted to work with people, but didn't know exactly where within psychology to sort of go. And I think it was during the second year, maybe, where I was sort of thinking around the clinical psychology route in particular. And thinking to myself, you know, I've, I remember reading the description of what a clinical psychologist does. And I was like, this is literally me in a nutshell this is quintessentially me because you've got everything in there that I really you know love I'm, I'm someone who enjoys kind of doing different things if I do the exact same thing every day in day out I know that that's not going to sit well with me and I really loved all these different facets of psychology in terms of working with with um, clients but also with teams you know working kind of on a broader level in terms of you know service development working collaboratively doing research the leadership things as well so it was working with different models and learning about all of these models all of that was just like yes yes and yes <laughs> yeah and then at the end of the third year I was thinking to myself do you know what I'm, I know I'm not going to get on as soon as I apply after an undergraduate degree but let me see what that's like so I remember like going through the application process to sort of see what that's like I didn't even submit it I just sort of wanted to see what kind of questions might come up and a year after that I did a master's in foundations of clinical psychology which was yeah it was one year but it, within that one year I feel like a lot of things happened very quickly in a short span of time because I managed to find a bit like a placement where one day a week I was a voluntary 
an honorary assistant psychologist in a local service. And then the rest of the week was sort of lectures and study time. And during that time, I was also a voluntary research assistant. So it's kind of involved in clinical stuff and research stuff and then doing my studies alongside. And again, I, I thought to myself, yes, this is exactly where I want to be heading. <laughs> And yeah, after I did my master's, I was really lucky to kind of get a paid position within that service where I was on placements. And I was also working part-time as a support worker with um, with service users with autism and or intellectual disabilities. And I was kind of juggling the two. And then later on, I got a, another part-time assistant psychologist post, and then they kind of complemented each other. And I was split two and a half and two and a half days. And again, I was really looking back, I think like I was really lucky to kind of land both of these knowing how much of a gold dust um, sort of thing they are now uh, but they were two very different services two very different teams and i really learned a lot from them and i do miss you know the people i work i remember <laughs> you know every colleague and every patient i've worked with very very well and then i remember applying for the doctorates probably four years i'm trying to remember how many years it's been and you know, I definitely had moments when I was thinking to myself, gosh, is it worth it? You know, this is really draining. This is a really hard process. And then I would go, you know, when I was sort of, when I had no's basically for one or two or three years or whatever. And I was like, hmm, you know, let me reevaluate, you know, where I wanted to be. I knew this is where I wanted to be heading. So I reviewed my whole application. I completely changed my sort of personal statements in there. Yeah. And then I managed to get couple of interviews and even though I wasn't successful after those interviews that I was like yes I'm on the right track with this you know something's different and they were really good learning experience in themselves and then lord and behold in 2021 I managed to to get an interview at the university I really really wanted and I was yeah I was so so chuffed with myself um, my family and friends again they've they were like, you really, really deserved this. <laughs> and it was definitely a very memorable moment for me, that phone call that I got. So that was a big oh. waffle there, Marianne. <laughs> it wasn't a waffle. It was wonderful. I could listen to you speak for hours, I think, Phil. I'll just, I'll just zip my mouth. You were really, really <laughs> interesting to listen to. And, you know, you. I'm always struck, as I'm, as I'm also struck by my own story as well of, of just this perseverance and this determination. And I was listening to you speak and I was thinking, gosh, moving off to a whole new country, like where you don't know anyone, that's such a big deal. And then I thought, mm. oh, yeah, you, you you, did do that too. <laughs> Mine was Wales, but it was still <laughs> three and a half hours away, you know. It's, it's mm. a big thing we do. You know, yours was obviously a whole different culture. It's not just England to Wales, but... We do move around a lot for our passions, don't we? Did you always know that you would want to come to UK and do your professional qualification in the UK? Would that have been an option to stay in Bulgaria or was that just not what you wanted? Yeah, good question. And I think it's a very complex and nuanced question because, yes, I did I did have the, the option to, you know, to, to go to Bulgaria and stay there and complete my studies there, but I just didn't really feel that was where I really wanted to sort of thrive and even now like nothing's stopping me you know after I finish my studies to go to Bulgaria and you know practice there if I wanted to but I just I feel like yeah there's something about the cultural mentality as well where you know at that time when I was applying for university I had friends who were already in the UK and saying really positive things about it and I just yeah, I remember being going through a period in secondary school where I was like really interested in the UK and the British mentality and I was like yeah this you know I could see myself <laughs> sort of in there. I felt like, yeah, in Bulgaria, certain things are kind of moving a bit slower than the West. And I think that's that's understandable considering what some of the sort of the values and beliefs in there are. So, for example, I'm the oldest of my siblings and being the only male for my siblings, I've kind of reflected on that as well, what that's meant in terms of having those expectations on me to sort of perform well, to know a lot of stuff to kind of lead the way to be that pathfinder you know like in the snow where you sort of you've got some really thick snow and you're sort of wondering where to go and you see that someone's already gone through that snow I kind of felt like I've been the person who've who's done that but yeah as you said it wasn't easy you know moving in itself for anyone whether it's from Wales or Bulgaria or wherever I was 18 at the time when I first started my undergrad and there were so many things I had to get to 
you know to get used to things i wouldn't even think about you know like how to set up a bank account or like a contract for your phone in another country you know they became actually really big things because now i'm the one responsible for doing this i'm creating this independence but it's not an easy step to take so yeah going back to your question yes i did have the option for that but i think i, I wasn't sort of ready for that that i think it felt kind of right and the thing is that i've got a lot of family and friends in bulgaria who i do visit at least once a year and it's it's kind of difficult because yeah i can't sort of they don't live around the corner and i can't go and visit them as often as i'd like to but i do feel sort of sometimes sad for the people who are still in bulgaria who have to deal with lots of kind of political turmoil and you know it's one of the poorest eu countries as well so it often gets portrayed that way. You hear lots of narratives about Bulgaria that way. And I want to sort of show another side to Bulgaria as well. So I've often reflected on that on my course as well, what it means for me to be someone who's got dual nationality as a Bulgarian and a British person. Yeah, absolutely. And when we look at the diversity of your cohort this year, like the one that you're in, how is that faring in terms of gender, in terms of background, in terms of diversity? How many are on your cohort and what's that looking for like for you at the moment? Yeah, so I'm in my final final year. I'm in my third year now in my course. And I think, yeah, compared to other cohorts and maybe other courses as well, I think we are a fairly diverse um, cohort. Again, I think overall within the whole country, there's still that kind of the you know there's not as much diversity as we want to but i think we are kind of getting there uh, so for example we are at the moment we're 28 we did start with a few more people well, we had a few mums on our cohort um who've given birth so we have six males including myself out of 28 so again that's you can see what the gender ratio is there but it's still better than like one or two or none none at all and I think for me, that's quite important, being a male, sort of, I've actually thought about that. What What is it for male trainees, not just where I am, but in other courses as well, to be in such an environment and to be with predominantly sort of female cohorts? It's, yeah, it's, I'm not sure how voiced or unvoiced it has been, but I've definitely sort of thought about that. Yeah, even I, my cohort was really, really small. Mine was 15. And oh. of those, there was three men. But I loved the male opinion, you know, and just the male dynamic as well that that stopped it being a group of 15 women. You know? <laughs> I really value I really valued that. And when you kind of got to do role play with the, the men versus the women, young women, whatever we were, whatever people identify as, um, I just really valued it. Yeah, I think there's so much to learn from each other regardless of our background regardless of our gender regardless of our culture like I just love how you come together as a cohort and you know like even when we're learning about group you know that forming storming norming mm -hmm. performing I love I love being part of that but I also love hearing other people's stories about how that develops and hopefully you want to still see some of them or maybe even all of them by the time you graduate you know that's mm. the hope that actually it's been it's been a, a enriching nourishing experience rather than one where you just like I can't wait to not see you again <laughs> ever <That's> hopefully <laughs> like, not really <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking to myself what it would have been like for me to be in a cohort of 15 people because yeah, obviously, with recent years, there's been a lot more funding for places. And I think the dyna the group dynamics could change as a result as well. So yeah, now as you're saying that, I'm sort of thinking, hmm, I wonder what it would have been like if it was the same amount of men, like six, but in a group of 15, would that have sort of changed mm -hmm. things? I, I find it, you know, at the time, one of my friends was in a cohort of 40, whilst I was in 15, because of course, there have been bigger universities. I loved it. It meant that we all had like a, a common room that we hung out in and there was just enough room for us all to sit on these super comfy sofas and squash up together. <laughs> and we all tended to spend all of our break times, not necessarily all of the lunch times because sometimes you go out into town, but we all tended to spend all of our break times and probably most of our lunch times together as a group. 
And it was really, really nice from my perspective. I can speak for myself, you know, I loved it, you know, and we'd on a Friday after after our personal development group, we'd tend to all as a standing date, all go to the pub when we finished, um, whether oh, or not people that. drinking and then or, or driving or, you know, whatever. We'd go and just kind of finish off the week spending time as a 15 and if one of us couldn't make it one day it was a bit like oh no like that's <laughs> like it was really nice whereas I know if it had been any bigger than that that would have made it tricky because you need a bigger room or you split up oh, or you nice. get like small clusters and even within that group there were obviously people that I was closer to than others but I really liked it being that size but I guess it's just you 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 learn what you experience don't you and you that becomes your norm so you know it's yeah it's different strokes for different folks but of course probably a smaller course maybe appealed to me yeah yeah there's just so much to kind of think about yeah and I think it's kind of inevitable the bigger the group becomes kind of the more likely it is to have these sort of smaller pockets of people yeah and I think cohesion is a really important thing because you kind of feel like you are you're in this together I remember one of our for one of our very first days and I started training we were told you know up until this point you've been competing to get here now you're not competing with each other you're working with each other so it kind of made us feel or at least made me feel uh, a bit less stressed about the whole thing thinking yes I've, I've made it <laughs> no, yeah. let, let me you know form connections with these people because you know who knows where we're going to be when we all qualify absolutely absolutely and there's a couple of things cropping up to me as you as you spoke there like the the image of you know during the pandemic there was that we're all in this together oh it was yeah like a really <laughs> choppy sea but some people were in speed boats and some were in like little kind of leaking sieves and you know even within a cohort you might have that you're physically in the same place expected mm. to do the same job but you might well have very different resources and kind of differences in terms of your kind of diversity and the barriers and the oppression and the, you know your your kind of yeah. privilege and uh, you know there's absolutely that within within there but I remember I don't know if you had anything like this maybe not maybe your ego is more robust than mine but <laughs> looking out on my <laughs> on my first day and like I'd always been like the psychologist in my friends you know oh ask Marianne or you know if it's about mental health like you know ask Marianne whatever <laughs> um and I, I really liked that you know so I'm not married to a psychologist and I don't know if I could be like <laughs> I like being <laughs> you know the psychologist and then looking out like uh, all these 14 other people and thinking oh there's nothing special about me like I found that almost a little bit tricky to begin with mm. you know who am I if I am not like if I'm not the psychologist which sounds really narcissistic doesn't it but it was no, yeah so. like just being able to bring myself and help myself develop as a trainee clinical psychology alongside these people was almost part of the journey for me as well, mm. I think. No, I think it's almost like an existential point that you reach in your adulthood where you like thinking what sets me you know, like apart, like who who's Phil, basically, what does who does Phil want to become? And even as I've been going through the different placements and so now I'm in my final placement for example I've kind of realized which therapy models are more aligned with or what kind of populations I enjoy working with the types of services which is really handy when it comes to applying for jobs when you can kind of you know not apply for every single job you're seeing but sort of really think about where you would be happy to work and yeah that's just an example of like something I've been thinking about throughout the whole three years you discover more about yourself about what you what you like what you don't like so for example one of my values is that I really value being part of a team so seeing people face to face is important to me so I can't imagine myself working in a service where everything is online for example and I also really value connecting long-term connections with people including with clients so you know I would struggle to sort of be in a setting where I'm only seeing a client for like a one-off sort of thing <laughs> and then you know off you go so I've kind of been reflecting on that as well. Well, what does that mean for me? Why, why, how come, you know, I've got these sorts of values. So we can go really deep here. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, I like having these sort of 
self-reflective moments because you you do start thinking i'm a psychologist and all these other people are psychologists but each one of us is bringing something different that's the beauty of it isn't it all of us are individual in that sense isn't it just and that's what i love about clinical placements as well is you get the chance to enter someone else's world for six months you get to try everything on you know mm. and you get to think which bits do i like which bits <laughs> don't i like which will i keep you know and which will mm. i leave here and then never never ever return to again yeah. and, and sometimes you know you get that opportunity that people are like oh well we've got maybe a qualified band seven job coming up we'd love it if you consider <laughs> coming back which is just like oh. and then you're like well do i want that and you know it's really really nice it's part mm. yeah like you say it's part of training that you kind of get to figure that stuff out but when i qualified actually it was in a very different um, economic climate which maybe i hope we're not heading towards again because of the increased importance and highlighting about how important mental health is whereas in 2011 when I qualified they sort of decided to save money by axing places for mental health training which has probably contributed to some of the mental health crises we see not just from psychology but um, you know they did it across different disciplines as well even there was some dalliances with mental health nurse funding wasn't there that they made it that you had to use you were, it was no longer bursary, you know, they, they were trying to save money everywhere. So when it came to us applying for jobs, we absolutely had the things that we would, would consider, this is a bit of me, but we were literally having to apply for everything. And I don't know how my career would have unfolded had I not had that, because actually my first qualified job was a 27 mile trip each way Crikey. you know up the m6 like it was not my first choice and you know i wouldn't necessarily have considered myself a cams mm -hmm. clinician but found myself working in a team that just was so good they won awards for safety wow. that it really helped me develop incredible foundations for qualified work they were compassionate they were kind they were lovely i did so much work with kind of diverse families and client groups and you know using interpreters mm. and it was just what i needed but i didn't know i needed it you know so yeah i ended up working there for almost four years as well but where i would have done you know i would not probably nobody would necessarily choose to do that commute because it was probably up to an hour and a half each way. I was worse off when I qualified because I then had to pay council tax and I obviously got no travel funding. So I was worse off as a qualified mm. than I was as a band six trainee, but I wouldn't swap it because it made me the clinician I am today. And I, I really like, really like the clinician I am and the stuff I do. So that is a complete yeah. other aside, but yeah, like, I hope you have an experience where you're delighted with your first qualified role, even though it might be one that on paper looks already a bit more like a bit of you than, than mine did. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Marion. And so kind of heartwarming to hear about your first job, because I think it'd be quite scary for third years, especially thinking, oh gosh, like I need to actually start applying for jobs and go to a job interview. <laughs> yeah. And you sort of finding that you really loved that um, that job and the people you were with, you learned so much from it. And I think that's probably where the placements have been really important for me, for me personally on our course. I feel like I've learned so much <laughs> from them. And I'm not sure how it was on your course, but with us, we sort of do two adult placements in the first year, both around five, six months long, and then two, five, six months placements in the second year one with children and young people the other one with people with intellectual disabilities and in the final year you do one longer placement so around 10 months ish long and you can kind of select your top three choices for which where you sort of want to be so the final decision isn't yours but you've got a lot more control and i managed to get my first choice for my third year and i was so over the moon and i've said to my partner like i didn't for a second like regret making that choice because i really feel like i'm learning so much and kind of heading in the direction i want to be heading it's so not just trainee phil but also future qualified hopefully dr phil <laughs> by the end of the year so um yeah i think placements are a 
really big part where you can start learning a lot. I've dealt with a lot of things in my placements that I wouldn't have even dreamed of doing when I was an assistant psychologist. Absolutely. And you do just end up having to walk because you find yourself to be there. And, you know, I felt quite emotional as you spoke then. Like I felt I had the feels like it made me feel like I might have a little bit, little bit of a cry. Like what, what a privilege, <laughs> you know, to to be able to have that level of personal and professional growth mm. and get paid for it. You know, and I know if you're a counselling trainee, you're listening to this thinking, I don't get paid and I have to pay. And there's such an inequity and I wish that could be changed. But, you know, speaking as a qualified clean psych who got paid to train it you know not every day was easy of course it wasn't but just incredible and I still think I've got the best job in the world like I love it I love it yeah same and you just kind of feel when it's right that you sort of like it's hard to verbalize it but you definitely at the end of the day when you come back and you're like yes it might have been a tough day but there's something about this that I really really mm. love yeah Absolutely. Is there anything else on this topic around kind of what we learn along the journey that that we haven't said or that you think might be useful or that comes to you for that kind of podcast topic title? Yeah, and I guess I'm kind of addressing this to anyone who might be watching this, not necessarily trainees qualified, you know, could be aspiring. At whatever stage you are, really pause and think about who you are because I remember one kind of teaching that we had is where the lecturer said to us, you know, imagine an animal, you know, pick an animal that you want to represent you as a, or where you would like to see yourself as a clinical psychologist. It was something along those lines. And I remember I thought really, really long for that. And in the end, I chose a chameleon. And so each one of us kind of went, we went around and we sort of, each one of us spoke about why they chose that animal. And I said, well, I chose the chameleon because I feel like, in a sense, I want to be someone who is flexible and adapts well to different environments and, you know, different needs. But at the same time, at the very core, I'm still the same person. So I might change sort of the colors, but I'm still there. The fill is still there. So I kind of want to incorporate that malleability and flexibility, but still stay true to what's important to me. Um, and my partner drew a chameleon and gave it to me as a, as a birthday gift later on. And I still have that. So every time I kind of see it, it sort of reminds me, yes, this chameleon is me. And I know why, <laughs> like, mm. I understand why. So really think about who you are and how other people would see you. I think that's such a nice reframe on a chameleon, because for me, sometimes the term chameleon is almost lobbied about as a bit of an insult like but I think you're right like it, it's about survival isn't it it's about you know being a part of something and helping it I don't know helping what needs to happen happen but in a way that isn't putting all your own stuff and your own agenda onto what the process is I don't think I'm explaining this very well but you know I get what you it's mean not, <laughs> yeah it's not it's not an insult, is it? It's it's a real skill to be able to do that. But of course, to to remain, like you said, to still remain the same underneath, but just to be able to, well, it's, it's an amazing survival strategy, isn't it? Like it's amazing as a, you know, it makes me think about Harry Potter and his invisibility cloak. Like what could you get <laughs> up to if you had one of those? Like, yeah. you know, what can you do if you can just be yourself but know how to help others around you maximize everything that they're doing, you know? Yeah, and I totally get what you mean when you first say, yeah, I wouldn't think about that. Because when I first thought about that, I was like, oh, but then people might think I'm like being a phony or like hypocrite or something and not really, you know, lying just to kind of please them or sort of. But I was like, no, I don't see it personally that way. Um, the important thing is that bit about the core the core of you yeah, is always the definitely. same about you because if I'm always the same and like if I you know don't adapt to different environments you know I'm not going to as you said yes yeah, survive but also thrive I think that's the other important thing you know thrive in an environment where I feel happy and passionate about what I'm doing so that's that's kind of how I personally see it but yeah every time I see that picture I'm like yes yeah. <laughs> it just warms my heart uh 
I come from a slightly earlier era in life where we actually used to write each other letters and put stamps on them oh. um, before emails dawned. And one of my friends um, used to write like a, a little quote or a little like <laughs> pause for thought nugget on the back of every envelope because he didn't want the postman to be bored. That is generally why, <laughs> genuinely why he did it. And it reminded me that. of... <laughs> a little little communication because postmen must read postcards and you thought this isn't a postcard it's a letter and on the back of one of them it said if you've always done what you've always done then you'll always get what you've always got and that is you know <laughs> that's a, that's in essence what that is isn't it I have loved our chat today like I'm so excited for just for you to to become qualified for you to stand there in your graduation robes and for me, in terms of change, I think I noticed it most. I didn't go to my master's graduation because I think they forgot to tell me about it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh, like that's not good. Me, <laughs> yeah, they, they sent me this certificate in the post like six months later when I said, well, where is it? Because they didn't tell oh, me. So, gosh. So I only went to my undergrad and my doctorate graduations so I only went to my undergraduate and my postgraduate doctoral graduations in my undergraduation I felt a bit embarrassed I felt a bit silly felt silly in my robes I felt a bit like a phony I didn't feel like a psychologist because I guess what I know is that I wasn't one and I was just a bit embarrassed I loved being with my family I loved being with my friends I loved going out for dinner afterwards with with our extended family but I, I didn't necessarily feel proud whereas my doctorate graduation I honestly felt so very proud of everything I'd achieved of wearing my little you know, soft floppy cap of being there with all of these incredible people who I called friends and colleagues. And I was so pleased and proud for them as well. I had this moment of standing. I did um, Coventry and Warwick Uni and they take it in turns for the graduation. One year will be in the Coventry Cathedral. One year will be in the Warwick in the in their theatre there. And we had the Coventry graduation and it was just like standing, queuing up by these you know, amazing stained glass waiting to go and get my handshake from the Dean, whatever it was, with my parents watching. And, you know, my who is now my husband was in a, a lecture theatre with his parents watching elsewhere. And just, I just felt so incredibly proud. And that is safe to feel about yourself, but also really lovely. And I, you know, I hope that you have that similar pride when it comes to be your time as well, Phil. Thank you, Marianne. Yes, so fingers crossed <laughs> that, uh, yeah, my graduation will be next year. I think they do it the summer after, so there's quite a big kind of gap. But hopefully a proud Phil, yeah. proud Dr. Phil, yeah. <laughs> could be standing there. And yeah. I think we should be proud at any point in time, even, you know, at the undergraduate. That's, that's massive. You know, that's a very big step in anyone's life. Yeah, I guess that evidence is just how much I changed from the age of 21 to the age of, I think I was about 30. You know, I'd grown a lot. I've done a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Had a great time personally and professionally. There'd been highs, there'd been lows, but genuinely. And I guess by the time I did my graduation for doctor, I'd already, I think that was November. I was just about, I think, to start my qualified role because I actually had some time off unemployed because there was no jobs. But yeah, I just, I just loved it. I loved it. And yeah, in terms of growth, it, you know, there's nothing like it. And then of course, once you qualify, you continue to grow and you absolutely should. So yeah, just yesterday, someone had said, they'd been stopped from progressing to 8A because someone had said, well, you haven't done a specialist core thing. You haven't done a bolt-on therapy since qualifying. And that wasn't something I'd ever heard of. But, you know, just in case people are listening, just try to get some sort of therapeutic skills advancement when you first qualify in the first couple of years. But that said, 
you know, you can go straight to 8A from qualifying. So that's not always necessary. But part of the podcast, I like to kind of educate people as and when I hear things. So that might be something people might like to consider. So, Phil, thank you very much. You are going to be joining us for another episode because I've so enjoyed our chat that we've decided we're going to do what was our original plan as a second follow up episode because it's just been so lovely to speak to you. Have you got a last nugget of advice for helping people avoid burnout on their way as aspiring psychologists, Phil? Gosh, uh, I could say so much about that, (laughs) but I'll keep it simple. You know yourself best. So one thing at a time, that's something that has personally helped me a lot, both before and during the doctorate, just chunking things. Otherwise, you can easily get overwhelmed with how much stuff is happening all together. Like, no, I'm going to do first this, then that, then that. And obviously life doesn't work that way, but I think even just saying it to myself helps a lot. So give it your best shot. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Just be kind to yourself. That's so nice. And, you know, just keep doing it. If you think it's a bit of you, like it was for you, you know, what's another year between friends, you know, if this might end up being your fantastic, beautiful, joyful career. Exactly. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I've loved it. I've loved it, Phil. Thank you for sharing your time so warmly with our audience as well. And if people have enjoyed um, what we've said, then they can look out for our next episode, which will be coming uh, probably in the next five or six weeks. What an absolute pleasure it was to speak to Phil. I liked it so much that we are seeing him again for a future episode as well. So stay tuned for that um, in the next few weeks if you are intrigued to see what it is we're going to be talking about. I would love to know what you think to this episode. Come along and let me know in the Aspiring Psychologist community, which is my free Facebook group. If you like the way I do reflection, if you like the way that it sounds like I can help you to grow and to shape your experiences and to get to where you want to be on the psychology career ladder, please do consider coming along and joining the Aspiring Psychologist community, which you can do from just £30 a month with no minimum commitment. Please take a moment to rate and review and if you're watching on YouTube please do subscribe, like, tell your friends, do all those good things. I hope you'll find some of the videos on screen coming up very shortly on YouTube to be useful for the next choice for you to watch. Um, I will look forward to coming along and seeing you for our next episode of the podcast whether you listen or whether you watch from 6am on Monday. Take care and thank you so much for being part of my world. Music